Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at central venous oxygen, mixed venous oxygen, what they are, what differentiates them, and the clinical factors that affect them. Now in the interest of time, I've already written a bunch of things out and we'll go from there. So firstly, what are SVO2 and SCVO2? So SCVO2 is the central venous oxygen, hence CV, and what this means is that it's oxygen content of blood that's drawn from the central vein or the superior vena cava. The implication of this is that it contains blood which has perfused the brain, which as we know is a very high oxygen extraction compared to most of the body, a normal measurement of which is around 60 to 80 percent. The SVO2 on the other hand is the mixed venous O2 or the oxygen concentration as it's measured at the pulmonary artery. The name in this case comes from the fact that the blood is sampled from a mix of blood, blood that is returned to the heart from the SVC in the brain, the IVC in the body, and the coronary sinuses of the heart, hence the name mixed. Because it's a mixed sample containing blood from the rest of the body, which is not, not only has more volume in total at any given time, but less oxygen extracted in the brain and the heart, the mixed venous O2 tends to be about 5% less on average than SVO2. <laughs> So now we have to look at what having a higher low mixed or central venous oxygen content means from a clinical standpoint. To explain this, I like to use a train analogy that I've written here on the left side of the screen where the red blood cells are the train cars, the heart is the train conductor determining the speed that the train cars travel, blood vessels are the tracks, the organs are the destinations, oxygen are the people, the lungs are where the people get on the train, and the sampling site for the SVO2 and SCVO2 are where we count the percentage of people left on the train. I'm going to leave this here for reference as we explore various pathologies. So let's start taking a look. So I've already pre-written this here using the analogy. Changes in cardiac output, which is the first thing we're going to look at, uh, would alter how fast the train cars or the red blood cells are circulating through the body. Higher cardiac output, more motion of blood, more flux through tissue. Lower cardiac output, the slower blood moves through tissue, and the longer it sits in that tissue. So when a patient has a good cardiac output, with normal being 4 to 8 liters a minute, and an otherwise normal healthy individual, it means that the train cars are able to move from destination to destination at an appropriate speed, dropping pro passengers off at an appropriate rate, thus leaving the patient with a normal percentage of people left at the sampling site. In physiology terms, the blood moves through the tissue at a physiologic normal speed, and tissue is able to extract the correct amount of oxygen from each red blood cell as it returns to the venous system. Patients with an increased cardiac output has a train that's moving faster. As the train moves faster, as we see here, it's harder for people to get off the train. Physiologically, the faster blood fluxes through a tissue, the less oxygen you're able to unload. Conversely, patients who have poor cardiac output where blood moves slower, allowing it to stay in the tissue for longer and allowing that tissue to extract oxygen, this will end up having a lower venous oxygen when sampled. So, increased cardiac output leads to, sorry, that was the trauma pager. Increased cardiac output leads to a higher SVO2 and a lower cardiac output will lead to a lower SVO2. I'll give you all a second to absorb that. Next, we'll look at the hemoglobin concentration. As I said before, the hemoglobin are the train cars in this example. The more train cars you have, the more people you can have on your train. Or the more PRBCs you have, or the more red blood cells, the more oxygen molecules you can carry. Tissue has a maximum amount of oxygen it's able to extract at a baseline. As a result, the more hemoglobin you have, the greater the total number of oxygen molecules you have after normal oxygen unloading in the tissue happens and returns to the sampling station. A lower hemoglobin or having less train cars means that every oxygen unloaded or every person that leaves the train drops the percentage by a greater amount than if you had more trains with more people. That's why if one person gets off out of 100, you still have 99%, but if one person gets off out of 10, if that's your carrying capacity, you only have 90% left. Therefore, a low hemoglobin can lead to a low SVO2 and can be improved with hemoglobin transfusions. So high hemoglobin will lead to high SVO2 as an isolated you know, thing, and a low hemoglobin you know, pathology will lead to a lower SVO2. So I'll give you all a second to take that in. Apologi Apologies again, uh, I'm recording this at work and the pager keeps going off. So, so 
Higher hemoglobin will leave you with a higher SVO2, and a lower hemoglobin will leave you with a lower SVO2. And as we said, can be treated with blood. Next, we'll take a look at passengers getting onto the trains or actually loading oxygen onto PRBCs, RBCs, I'm sorry. In this case, we're going to look at the lungs. Now, this is a similar concept as hemoglobin, only with the number of people you load rather than the number of train cars you have available to load onto. If you have 14 train cars filled completely with people or fully saturated hemoglobin, you have a better chance of having a high or normal venous oxygen content. Patients who have poor ability to oxygenate their blood or load their hemoglobin, such as COPDers or people with other types of VQ mismatch, will have less oxygen loaded onto their red blood cells and thus higher venous, venous oxygen content. Uh, this would be the same as not being able to get all of your trains filled with people. Clinically, oxygenating these patients, providing PEEP, or improving their VQ match would improve their SVO2. So decreased oxygen saturation leads to decreased SVO2. Increased O2 leads to increased SVO2. Again, give you a second to take that in. Next, we need to take a look at oxygen delivery. In other words, we need to look at whether or not oxygen is able to be unloaded at peripheral tissues, or in the analogy, if patients are actually able to get off at their destinations. Temperature is a factor that may affect unloading of oxygen onto tissue. The warmer a patient is, the higher the metabolic rate demand is. As a result, patients who are hyperthermic, they'll have a lower central venous oxygen as more oxygen will be unloaded onto the tissue. Or the way that I think about it, kind of the cheesy way, is that people like warm weather, I like warm weather, and they're going to get off at their destination if it's warm. Conversely, colder tissue, as we know, has a lower metabolic demand, which is why we have hypothermia protocols for patients with cardiac arrest in the hope of decreasing the oxygen demand of the brain to prevent anoxic brain injury. So if it's cold out, people don't want to get off the train, and in this example, would result in a higher SVO2. Increased temp leads to lower SVO2. Decreased temp leads to increased SVO2. Give you a second to soak that up. I'm gonna go ahead and erase it and look at our last one. Shunting is another way that central venous oxygen may wind up higher than normal. Imagine the train with the people on it simply takes an alternate route bypassing destinations to unload people or the blood bypasses tissue to oxygenate. Therefore, patients with fistulas, for example, or any type of abnormal connection between the arterial and venous system will skip tissue to oxygenate and wind up back at the sampling site. Those passengers never get off at those destinations. As a result, shunts can cause a patient to have increased amounts of oxygen when it returns to the central venous system. So shunts increase SVO2. I'm going to erase this. And the last thing that we're briefly going to mention here, as it seems to still be under discussion in my reading, is oxygen uptake. And it's important when discussing venous O2. So a, ma a major example, uh, cyanide toxicity. And sepsis or infections. These conditions can mess with the mitochondrial function, thus decreasing cells' ability to utilize oxygen. In the analogy, people get off their destination, but then immediately reboard the train and ride it back to the sampling station. So decreasing oxygen utilization will increase SVO2. Decrease O2 utilization by cells increases SVO2 in which case you have to treat the underlying pathology. The reason I say it's under contention is that sepsis, uh, when I've read a couple of textbooks, say that it doesn't necessarily change the SVO2, but cyanide toxicity definitely does. So that's all for venous oxygen. If you have any questions or topics you want covered, please feel free to write to us. If you want to get involved, please contact us. Otherwise, check in for the next video and be sure to subscribe below.